Uh, so good morning, everybody. And uh, as you know, it's Kim Gafford here with my coffee, trying to have a sip here in theme. Uh, today we're going to take another walk, um, and this is to the Fresh Swamp and Payne Farm Trail. Um, and you'll see that it's a pretty diverse uh, site. <clears throat> so we'll go through that. We start at Payne uh, Road and we end at Lakeside Drive. And I will have, uh, we'll just go right to the next one. Uh, this is, oh, I switched the slides. Oh, well, this is our spar starting point on Payne Road. <clears throat> and uh, you just kind of balance yourself over the stone wall, which are very st steady. So they're like little steps down. And that's in site one. So this is the uh, overall map of where we're going to be going today. Um, and um, uh, so part of the map is covered up with your faces. So I'll kind of wing it here. <clears throat> but we start here on uh, Payne Road at stop number one. And then at stop number two, we are just coming out and we're taking a view at Payne Farm, which is roughly this area here. And then stop number three, we're at the corner of this field and we're looking at this field. And rather than put in uh, numbers for every single photo that I have, every slide, I've just identified the number for the area. So you, you'll see many slides that say three and there are photographs and things along this part of the path. Likewise, when we get to stop four and start talking about this field, uh, things four are this part. And then we'll be going into the shrubland and uh, we don't really get uh, anywhere near any fresh water, any swampy water at this time of year. There are a few places along the path that can be a little wet, but uh, not in July. Oops, I keep doing that. Let's see if I can go back. There we go. Um, ooh, very sensitive screen here today. Um, so, and then we'll end over here on Lakeside Drive. So this is a good walk if uh, you have a companion and you don't want to do a uh, you know, dead end and, and round trip for somebody to leave their car at one end and then go start at the other. But it's not that far, it's just about a little less than a mile one way. So, and uh, with that, we'll uh, kind of go on to our next stop after we took the, um, the uh, entry which I showed you before. The first part of the path has these uh, pieces of board down because it does get quite swampy in this area. Um, although it's not near fresh swamp, it's got a very high uh, water table. And in this part of the island, just adjacent to these fields, is, are the well, is the well field for the town's uh, water company. So um, there's quite a bit of uh, perch water in the land in this area. You're going to see as we go along that <clears throat> good part of the walk, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> is in a tunnel or the vegetation is quite close in. Uh, so um, this will just get you started. This first part's not too much. What you see along the sides here, lots of shrubby areas, and there's some interesting things when you look um, as you go. For one thing, there's this uh, plant hidden in there along this part of the path, and this is a hawthorn. And there's um, hawthorns are pretty hard to key out to uh, species, but <clears throat> they're generally um, have the same features, most specifically these very long spikes. Uh, so it is a thorny plant. And then these are the berries. Um, <clears throat> so in the, along the path, there's this hawthorn, which you don't see in a lot of places on Black Island. So that's sort of an interesting uh, shrub to, to find in there. Uh, a week or maybe last week, I can't remember, I was talking about elderberry and how it was blooming and looks a lot like arrowwood. Well, now some of the elderberry blossoms have actually started to fruit. And you can see uh, that that's what this is. So we have some still blossoming, some still blossoming and some fruiting. And then we have this uh, funny tree that has different kinds of leaves here than up here. 
And it's like, what is that? Well, it's an apple tree. And you can, if you look at those lower, it's got, it's a, probably a crab apple with these small apples, um, just, you know, starting to green up and take form. Um, and then what, oops, wrong way. It's being completely enveloped by oriental bittersweet. So you'll see, I'll be talking quite a bit about the balance of this walk has a lot of invasive species of which the oriental bittersweet is definitely one. And it's a big vine. It crawls up the tree. It uses the tree as its armature for supporting itself. So that's what you're seeing up here at the top of the tree is um, the bittersweet getting all the sun and down in the lower part, the apple tree is struggling along. Um, might be a good stewardship uh, project to sort of release some of these wonderful trees and shrubs along this path from their, from their invasive vines. But then when you get to uh, what's on the map is site two, um, you can look across at this sort of quintessential picture of Payne Farm. And Payne Farm is a, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the last farms going and hasn't actually raised livestock in quite a while. Uh, it used to be hayed. I'm not sure it's even being hayed anymore. Um, but that giant elm tree is classic. You can see it from many places around the island. There were actually two of them planted when the house was built around 1877. And only that one elm uh, is still around. But it gives you it's a really great view of um, the, the fields. This land actually is that we're looking at, um, I believe we uh, have easements on it. It's actually still owned by um, some of the Phelan. Uh, Paynes um, uh, became Phelans. And, and well, that's another story. We won't get into gene genealogy today. <laughs> so Payne Farm, wonderful, beautiful view. Um, and then when you go at that same place, uh, so on the map, number two is looking at the previous view. Number three is looking at the corner of this big field. And uh, we're right in the corner. We've come from the path that came from uh, Payne Road, and we are looking this way, which is more or less <clears throat> west. And then the path goes along the, you could sort of get the sense of a corner here. Uh, it goes this way, more or less south. And um, the field that I was just um, pointing to previously is over here to the um, to the sort of northwest uh, of this field. This field last year when I walked it had not been mowed. This year it seems to be being mowed. So it is uh, um, quite, it was a, actually a little disappointing to me because a lot of the things that were growing in this field have now been mowed off. Uh, but there are plenty of things along the edges to look at. Um, but when you get to, so the, where, where I was looking just a moment ago was in the corner here. Now we're in diagonal corner of this field. And it's all mowed except for this one little island of vegetation. And uh, that is an island of, here it is, this is dogbane. And uh, dogbane, or um, I think it's also called Indian hemp, is in the milkweed family. It's generally considered to be a little bit of a nuisance uh, in fields, so I'm really not sure why it's being maintained as a little island of dogbane, but there it is. You can see it really stands out. And uh, in the foreground, some of this is uh, the switchgrass or panic grass, um, one of the warm season grasses that is, they have not yet gone to seed, it'll be another couple of weeks, but a very beneficial uh, grass um, throughout the island. And then uh, here's a close up of it. And um, doesn't, it looks a little, if you're used to looking at the form of milkweed, you can see that it is a milkweed. It does have the white um, substance when you um, cut its stem. Um, but that is one of the milkweeds of this field in a little island of dogbane. It's, it's quite curious to me. <laughs> Um, back at the first corner of the same field, big open field uh, that's been all mowed. This is the path that goes along the edge and it kind of goes down here and then makes the corner and goes along the other edge of this field. And this part has been fairly recently mowed, but things are starting to come back. And what you're seeing here, here and quite a bit here and actually throughout 
is um, uh, swamp milkweed. So it's another one of the milkweed family uh, that we do have and just starting to bloom around the island now. Um, sometimes in open fields, um, they do of course like the edges of swamps and marshes. Um, there's quite a bit of, uh, it's quite wet in here in the summer, in the uh, springtime. So there must be a layer of clay that holds the water at the surface so it gets enough water. But it's sort of, last year when I took this walk, oops, all of these little plants that are not going to bloom had, had uh, swamp milkweed blossoms on them. So that was your second milkweed. Um, if you go to the edge of the path, the part that's not mowed, you're still seeing a few of the common milkweed in blossom on your left. Um, again, beautiful uh, plant. I love the form of the flowers of the milkweed and uh, quite a fragrant um, flower. Um, but they are starting to sag a little as this one is and pretty soon it'll start to form the uh, milkweed pods that we're all used to. Also in the field um, was some of what's to the right, and this is a yellow thistle. It's uh, just past blooming, so it's pretty much gone to, um, gone to seed. Um, I could see in the field that was all mowed, uh, lots of little, it was like spotted pretty evenly and consistently and numerously with the base um, leaves of this uh, plant. Um, this is a, a native thistle. It's not an invasive. A lot of the thistles are invasive. Uh, this is a native one and it's, again, uh, to my mind, too bad that they mowed this field and um, cut down all these uh, thistle. This one I found at the very edge of the field that wasn't mowed, but the whole field had been full of them. Uh, again, along the edge, you see some other native things growing. Um, winterberry, which is also known as, uh, it's an ilex, it's in the holly family. Um, can you hear my plane going over? <laughs> no? No, you can. Uh, if you look closely, it's in the, oh, I think I can spread it open, yeah. You see the berries are right in the axles of the uh, leaves, and that is a very typical form for um, holly. Um, so uh, winterberry is in the holly family. This is what you'll see around the island in uh, late fall, November. Beautiful gray um, shrub that's lost gray in its its uh, wood, lost all of its leaves and bright red berries. It's it's just gorgeous. So here it is, just starting its summer growth, and then right next to it, um, the, these are the berries of um, Virginia creeper which is a, a native vine that does crawl around uh, the walls of Block Island. They will also, the leaves will turn bright red, but uh, they actually have quite uh, succulent berries um, that are a great food source throughout the, um, through the fall. So they're just starting to bury up as well. So last couple of weeks ago, we were seeing a lot of things just starting to bloom in the shrub and vine area, but now they're starting to bury up. Okay. Then moving along, hmm. ah, we get to the corner of the field um, where I was looking. If you look behind where this view is being taken, uh, is that open mode field with uh, only things around the edge that is not mode. And then this little gapway, and it goes into the adjacent field, which looks like, like this. And this is how the field should look, at least to me. <laughs> it's a wonderful meadow. It's got a lot of meadow grasses, lots of things growing in there. Uh, you see little islands you see, but they're all switched grass, um, which is the panic grass that I mentioned, which is a, a great uh, warm season. There are many other grasses in the mix and lots of wildflowers. Um, here's another view of it. Um, and you're just starting to see, if you look closely, there's a butterfly weed right there. Um, and if you look really closely, all of a sudden things really start to come into focus. And there's quite a bit of butterfly weed, which is a native, uh, another milkweed. Um, this is a plant that loves open, sunny fields. Um, the, worse the, the worse the soil is, the better it is for it. You don't have to worry about watering it or um, 
or uh, making sure it's high in nutrients. Um, so beautiful flower. I uh, love the butterfly weed and there are very few places left on Black Island. Only places that are managed for open grassland and, and open meadows um, still have butterfly weed. Unless of course you have it in your in your garden. And I just love that it happened to have a nice little black eyed Susan there with it. It's a nice pairing. Here's another view of it. It's quite, uh, some places it's single stalks of butterfly weed, but uh, it's actually quite lush up there. And there are many of these sort of uh, areas like this one where it's, you know, a nice big clump of butterfly weed. And if you look even more closely, you can actually see a butterfly on the butterfly weed. So appropriate. And it, I can't, um, I don't think I ever quite appreciated how much the color of the monarch butterfly matches the color of the uh, butterfly weed. So it's uh, quite beautiful. It's worth it. Do not pick this plant, but it is definitely worth to go. And most of these uh, views are in view from the path that I was walking. You don't have to go traipsing out into the field. Not that I wouldn't, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, there's lots of briars and other critters in there, like ticks. <laughs> so stay on the path and you still get these wonderful views. And there's lots of other stuff. Once you start looking closely, uh, mix in in this great meadow, um, Black-Eyed Susan, um, a, a plant, a wonderful little plant called Fleabane. Um, you can't see it? Um, okay, so fleabane and uh, and right next to it is the first goldenrod I've seen of the season. In fact, I did this walk in uh, two different days, and so the photos, some are taken late in the afternoon and some are taken early in the morning. This photo was taken uh, the second day and it had bloomed in the space of one day. It had gone from uh, just almost yellow to yellow. Um, lots and lots and lots of different kinds of goldenrods as we'll see throughout the coming fall. Uh, this happens to be sweet goldenrod um, and it has very narrow leaves. Um, its form is kind of a branching type, not a flat topped or a wand type. So uh, a lot of times you get into these groups of plants, um, there's so much you start learning a lot more about their forms and uh, how to divide the groups out. So suddenly, you know, goldenrod, which might have 50 different species on Black Island becomes a lot more manageable if you can at least get them down to one of three forms. And so this one, I was very happy to actually key out as sweet goldenrod. And it was sweet because it made me think, yes, fall is actually gonna come. Now, when you get to the corner of this field um, right here, this is, uh, we've come along this whole field, which was quite large. We stayed on the path. Um, there's a friendly little sign here. It says public that way, private this way. Um, and as you go down this path, you're going down into the shrubland uh, part of the, sort of the fresh swamp part of this walk. This walk is very, uh, it's very sharply dichotomous. It's open grassland and meadows and it's shrubland. And um, if you came, if you walked and you wanted to have wonderful open sweeping views, stop here and go back. <laughs> because from here on, it's going to go down into the shrubs. Uh, you see this big tree here, it gets very tunnel-like. Um, yeah, the path gets a little more rugged. Um, again, erratic boulders. This is just, um, this is about halfway down a hill. And actually I'm, in this photo on the left, I'm actually looking up the hill. It looks at first like you're looking down, but I'm looking up the hill. I've already come down, turned around to take a view of uh, a photo of these three erratic boulders, which are supporting a wonderful life that you would not have seen out in the open uh, meadow. Uh, one is uh, all kinds of lichens. Uh, the rock on the left here has these small, what they call concentric boulder lichen. And if you look more closely, which I think I can make it do. There we go. Um, you can see they grow in concentric circles. You get a little spot of lichen and just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, 
So that's a gray, one of the gray lichens. There are again, many, many, many lichens. Uh, and then over here you have what's called a green shield lichen. Uh, and again, this is a group of lichen. There are then specific green shields. Uh, there's you know probably a dozen green shield lichens that you could find on Black Island. And the little gray lichen up here is different than the gray lichen over here. So um, I've probably bored everybody with lichens a little too much last week, so I'll uh, move on from the lichens. <laughs> but it's darker and moister down in the shrublands. Uh, the understory have lots of these plants. That one, the rock on, uh, facing the one with the lichen was covered with moss. And it's sort of interesting to think, why does one rock have lichens on it and the other one have moss? Um, moss and ferns, like lichens, are big groups. And uh, I did not attempt to um, key these out to species. Well, I did attempt. The fern, um, I think, is lady fern. It could be cinnamon fern, but it doesn't seem to have the right form. And cinnamon fern gets its name from its spore spike, which uh, it doesn't have at this time of year. So, but I'm pretty sure it's lady fern. And it grows all along the edge of the path when you're in, uh, in the cooler places. You see it at the very beginning of this uh, path, when we just stepped off a of pain road where it's dark and cool and a little bit moist. Uh, and then you don't see it when you go out into the open. And then when you come back, back down into the shrub part of this walk, you see ferns uh, along the path. And I attempted to take this photo so that you can actually see that along this edge is the path. And the ferns are just right there, um, looking quite lush and beautiful. Uh, sometimes you find things that are reminiscent of nature that you don't see. And um, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the phrase nature red tooth and claw, meaning nature is, can be harsh. And uh, this is the remnants of a bird that was taken out most likely by another bird, um, probably a marsh hawk or something like that got this bird. And if you're familiar with your birds, you're going, hmm, what kind of bird is that? with those gray feathers and black feathers. Um, and there's, uh, if you were guessing catbird, you would be right. Uh, this, this is a gray catbird, not the one obviously that was, met its demise on the path, but gives a great picture of a catbird because the gray catbirds are in fact gray and they have that black cap. They're very chatty, they're in the mockingbird family. Um, and around your house, they can get quite bold. And uh, this is at my friend Martha Vili Gass's house, and uh, she shares her breakfast with this one catbird every day. She has to like guard her cereal bowl uh, when she gets up to get her coffee, otherwise the catbird steps right up to help itself. So hopefully this cheeky little catbird will keep away from the, uh, fr the uh, fresh swamp trail. Um, lots of other, you know, tons of wonderful plants, a good mix of natives and invasives. Uh, on the left uh, are red maple, and there's actually only two that I saw along this path, but they're very big and spreading and arching. And the thing I've been noticing this summer as I've been looking more closely is often where the red maple is this big, its root system is right near the surface. So the path Again, oops, you have to be very careful when you uh, go over the path because of the roots. I uh, could trip you up, get, pick up your feet. And no, I did not fall, I'm very cautious. But um, beautiful red maple. And then again, also along the path um, in the understory, these you would often see out, you can see these both in the fields and uh, along the sides. And this is the oxide daisy. These were quite small. I think that the plant had recently been trimmed. The, the path had been trimmed recently and um, a lot of things may have been <laughs> cut down that would have been there uh, at this particular moment. Um, other things that it start to see this time of year, especially along the edge of paths, is this deer tongue grass on your left. That's actually a grass. It's in the same family as the switchgrass. It's a panicum. Uh, which is a, a family of grasses, a warm season uh, grass. And s later in the summer, this plant will grow along 
uh, stalk with the seeds heads on the top. And uh, I guess the, uh, the leaves, the way they clasp around the stem are, are reminiscent of a deer tongue. That is deer tongue grass. It's very rough, it's hard, it's dense. So you don't, if you have to mow that, you better do it slowly, otherwise your mower is gonna stop. <laughs> and also along um, there, this is the berry patch. And um, this is a good mix of natives and, um, and invasive vines. So a lot of these, this is a big patch of grape, wild grape, and their big broad leaves and their sort of curly tendrils that are reaching out. And all through here, in this case, the grape is the armature that is supporting a lot of blackberries. You see all those up there and through here and all through uh, down here. So this is actually, I will say, there are a lot of blackberries fairly close to the path. Uh, of course, they're all green right now. And uh, there are several sort of yard paths that intersect the main path along this part of the, the fresh swamp part of the walk. So I'm sure the neighbors get in there pretty quickly, but uh, keep that in mind if you're going blackberry picking that uh, the fresh swamp trail is a good place to start in about 10 days. So, but there's a good mix. We have your, your, your uh, native blackberries and your invasive grape, both producing fruit and holding each other up. Other natives seen along the way were on the left, something called wineberry. Um, it's in the rubus family, which is blackberry, um, but it is actually a raspberry. So a raspberry, as you know, the fruit comes off a bundle of seeds rather than the seeds being in, in each individual bit of the, uh, of the fruit. So um, this wineberry that will get that hairy husk will open up and then the, the, uh, the, uh, the fruit will be in there and you can pluck it off. They're quite tasty. But uh, a lot of the research I did on these this morning or yesterday talked about them as being a problem and getting in and uh, taking over an area. And so there's lots of discussion about how to control the wineberry. Out here, I do see it regularly but i don't think they're um they don't seem the blackberries seem to be much more in control of the situation but um they are tasty so if you happen to find them uh wait for the husk to fall off though that's pretty spiny and then of course uh the japanese honeysuckle there are native honeysuckles um and a few on block island but almost all of them are the invasive vine growing uh, honeysuckle beautiful uh, if you pull out this little stamen right here, at the bottom will be a little drop of honey um, that's growing there. And I once, I once taught um, eight-year-old triplets from New Jersey boys how to uh, get the little drop of honey out of honeysuckle. And I lost them at the nature walk from that point on. All they wanted to do was pick honeysuckle and, and and suck out the little drop of dew. And at the end of the walk, my, I was well rewarded because their birthday was coming up and what they said to their parents was what they wanted for their birthday, they live in New Jersey, was a honeysuckle plant. So I, I always thought that was pretty great. Another invasive, uh, this is mile a minute vine. Um, it was first identified on the island in 2008 in this very part of the fresh uh, swamp trail. And um, I've marked this as the eighth stop. It's almost exactly on the trail, if you look back at the map, where this vine was um, first sighted and reported again in 2008. Um, about 2017, um, so some people working at URI and biological control have introduced a weevil. Uh, so. Um, the smile a minute is n is not a native. It's a uh, it's actually sometimes called um, Asian tear thumb. If you look at the stem on this picture, you see it's got these backward facing little tiny barbs. It's almost they're small, but they're sticky. So it's like Velcro. It, you know, you, once you get it on you, it's sort of hard to pull it off. But they're not strong, so you can pull it off. It's not like a, it's not like hawthorn. Um, but what's interesting to me is uh, the last two years, and this year um, even stronger than last year's. You're seeing all these little 
holes in the leaves. And um, that is from the weevil uh, eating on the plant. And it has a wonderful uh, life cycle. So the weevil is also Asian. So of course it developed in the same place as the uh, mile a minute vine. And uh, the weevil will lay its eggs near the end, uh, the tip of the plant. And then when the egg emerges into a larvae, it will bury into the stem of the plant and eat out the center of the stem. Um, and uh, of course that's not good for the plant, that is detrimental. And then when the larvae then hatches or uh, you know morphs into the beetle, uh, the weevil, then it will also eat along the, um, the leaves. So uh, this might, I've started last year and then uh, this year starting to see that almost all of the mile minute patches that I've looked at have evidence of uh, the weevil eating it. So it'll be interesting over the next uh, you know, decade to see if we can get a little bit of control on this. This is, a, it grows about six inches a day uh, and uh, although that's not quite a mile a minute, um, that's pretty fast for a plant growing. And it grows these great arcing mats that grow up over the trees, shade the tree out or whatever vegetation you have and, um, and, and kill it. So most of these invasive vines, that's their, that's their strategy. They grow up, use the, uh, the native plant, the apple tree or the, you know, whatever tree, sh uh, shad or, arrowwood and grow all over it forming a dense mat that then shades the plant and makes the plant suffer. Um, so be interesting to see if we are able to get a handle on mile a minute vine. It is an annual. It uh, has a beautiful blue berry uh, which is said to stay viable in the soil for seven years. So um, the trick with this is to try to get it and pull it before it sets berries. So if you have this in your yard, and, and lots of people do, uh, it, you've got to pull it off of your plants and try to, you know, your hedge or your shrubs or where, wherever it is along the side of your driveway and pull it off and, uh, and try to do it before the seeds set because otherwise once those seeds get going, they get dispersed and it becomes harder and harder to uh, get rid of it. And there we are. We're at the end of the path. Uh, this is at the Lakeside Drive side. It's a step style uh, that goes over the stone wall. And um, we sort of ended as we did, sort of in a sort of a little tunnel of vegetation in the path going over a stone wall, meeting up with the road. But lots of interesting things in between. Um, it's well worth the walk. Uh, it does get a little warm in there uh, during the heat of the summer, so I would pick your time of day well. And uh, But the views at the Payne Farm part and along the uh, Fresh Pond Trail are really quite great. And the topography, I didn't say much about this, but the topography of the Fresh Swamp Trail part of this walk is very up and down. And it's going, and at the bottom of the downs, it's very tends to be very wet in the springtime. It's not now. And there's, it's all funneling water towards the fresh swamp area, which is sort of a, a matrix of uh, open and water and uh, swampy areas. Uh, <laughs> jets flying in overhead. Um, actually, this is not too far. This particular slide is uh, on Lakeside Drive. is not too from, far from the airport, so maybe that was appropriate. So each one of these walks, I end with a sort of a discussion of what's around the island now and, and besides what you're seeing on this walk. Um, and last week I had a question about dragonflies, about amber colored dragonflies. I'm not sure that this is the one that was being asked about, but I did go out to the Hodge uh, Preserve after the talk last week and there were many um, sort of golden colored uh, dragonflies that had a patch on it. Most of the patches went the whole width of the, the um, they call this a band. Most of the bands went the whole width of the, uh, the wing. Um, and this is a very close up picture. You would not see that, um, that degree of detail if you were with the naked eye unless you had it really still, which if you've ever chased dragonflies, you know that doesn't happen very often. 
but I, uh, Nigel Grinley is a local um, um, naturalist of it, and he's a, was a special. He is a specialist on dragonflies and now moths. Uh, so I asked him about the description, and I was sympathetic because I get a lot of calls like Kim. I saw this bird; and it was brown, and it had a red spot on it. And you know, my view of red and somebody else's view of red, and where the spot was is always—it's kind of a crapshoot whether or not you have any chance of identifying it. So I was—I gave him that introduction, <laughs> and uh, he thought it could possibly have been a seaside dragonlet, which we do have on the island, which are around a lot right now and the males uh the um the banding does go all the way through the wing so um, even if it's not this one it's a beautiful dragonfly and this is a great time of year to be looking for dragonflies on block island uh this is another wonderful thing that i got to see uh this is a hummingbird nest it's got two baby hummingbirds in it uh and it's an amazing nest. It's just an amazing nest. It's made of uh, down and, and um, spider silk and little bits of lichen. And it's very um, pliable. It stretches. And apparently as the young grow, it stretches to get bigger. Um, and you can tell that there are two babies in here. And this is a baby. This, this bird actually fledged three days after it, uh, this photo was taken. Um, but you can see it has two tails sticking up, um, even though you can only see the one head and it's all about the uh, perspective. So I was very lucky to get this photograph. And the, uh, a hummingbird nest is about, I'd say it's an inch and a half to two inches uh, uh, in radius. So pretty tiny. Um, what else? What? Oh, tiny and huge occurrences in late July. Well, here's a tiny one. If you go on this walk, you might be plagued by deer flies. <laughs> and I had a whole herd of them after me on my walk. So I forgot that hats are good. So it was a little insect repellent. Um, this one finally met its end. And it was a little twisted for, uh, but I took a photo of it in my hand. And Either it was the leader or all of the harassment I was getting was coming from this one deer fly because I didn't have any problem after this. <laughs> um, but I, this is also the time of year for pesky insects and deer fly are same, many species of them, but they all have uh, clear wings except for this banding spot. And then of course, some huge occurrences in July. Right now, you've probably all been reading about or hearing about Comet Neowis, um, which is visible uh, in the evening after, after dark. Uh, so you're gonna shoot for 9.30 or later uh, in the area of the Big Dipper. Uh, this is a photo from CBS News. This is not my photo. <laughs> uh, I have been out looking. I haven't actually seen it yet. Um, but I understand that uh, with a pair of binoculars in a dark sky, uh, we can get pretty good views of it. And on Block Island, I, I went early last night to look, not early, like around 930, which I should have been able to see, but there was too many very bright neighborhood lights. And by the time I looked again a few hours later, uh, the lights were out, but the fog was in. So, uh, so you have to really kind of just catch it. And uh, I would say if you're on Block Island, go to the Haas Preserve some evening and by yourself or with your pod and um, enjoy the uh, crop circle or the astronomy circle in the middle of that and look up into the night sky and see if you can't find a uh, comet Neowise. It'll be another 6,800 years before you can see it again. Um, let's see, with that, I need to thank an assistant that I had when I, when I was doing my, uh, my, my reconnaissance walk, I came out and um, Zoe Gass was on Payne Road wanting to show me that she had found a monarch caterpillar. And it's the first monarch caterpillar that I saw this year. So I asked if I could take her picture and we both held our breath so I could get close enough to take the picture and not breathe on each other. It was really quite a fun game that we had with each other. Uh, and uh, so without her help, we would not have had the picture of the uh, 
monarch caterpillar. Something to start looking for now on Block Island. And if you haven't raised a monarch caterpillar through its life stages to a chrysalis and onto a monarch butterfly, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's nothing like it. Uh, the colors, the wonder of metamorphosis is stupendous. And with that, I will thank you with my bird list from the walk. Uh, if you go on this walk, you could be looking for these fairly common birds. And um, thanks for hanging in there. And if you have any questions, Charlotte will surely take you off mute. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, Kim. That was fabulous. I'm going to unmute everybody if anyone wants to comment or have a question. I think everyone can chime in now. This is Peter. I just want to say thank you very much. That was uh, really informative and I look forward to a hike. Good. Are you on an island or are you off island? I'm in Narragansett, but I get out there probably three, four, five times a year to either bike ride or hike. So I'll be making oh. a plan. That's great. Have you ever gone on this trail? I have not. Nope. So that's a new one to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, enjoy it. It's not too far from town. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, Kim. It was lovely to see that trail and you. <laughs> I'm afraid I won't be hiking it very oh, much. Oh, Elspeth. <laughs> I know. I know. I'll, I'll not be out to hike it, but uh, it brings back such a lot of memories and they're very good ones. Uh, <laughs> and also a lot of information that I wish I'd known at the times when I used to walk them. You'll be back, Elspeth, next time. Oh, I'll be back sometime. <laughs> we'll have to wait till those planes get flying again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks for tuning in. So great to see you. It's a pleasure. Uh, somebody's raised her hand. Uh, Judith. Judith, do you have a question? Yes, I have a question. Um, back to the lichen. I think mm -hmm. I heard uh, it called green shield lichen. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. So uh, the lichens are, it's a group of lichens that grow on uh, rocks. Um, and, Go ahead, Kim. Uh, the group of lichens that grow on rocks and it's, they like a shield on the rock and there's sort of that light green color. Um, let's see, where is that one? Here we go. There we go. So, uh, my photo, let's see if I can move you people. I'm going to try that. Would, would you say it's a friendly lichen? And if it's yes. growing on my patio, I should let it be? I think lichens are generally friendly. Um, and if it's growing on your patio, if it's not, if it's not a place where you walk where it might get slippery, I'd say let it be. Uh, lichens are an interesting combination of a, a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a and an algae, so a plant and a and a fungus. And um, lichens are responsible for. They're a pioneer species in breaking down. Um, the substrate of rocks uh, to eventually form um, soil eventually um, and um, they get the the fungus helps to break down the rock and take the nutrient out for the organism and the um, the algae that's embedded is in this relationship is uh, does the photosynthesizing and produces the energy for the organism and um, unless it's bothering you aesthetically or you know you're sitting on a bench and you're always coming off with pieces of green shield lichen on your pant leg um i'd say leave it whenever you can um well thank very you i'm glad to know this good thank and you there's, very much you're welcome you're welcome Kim, thank you so much again. I wondered what time of day did you do your walks? Um, one, I did it in two different parts. I did one in the evening, uh, you know, like around six o'clock, I think. So the light was getting kind of low and golden. And the other one I did the next morning because I wanted to get some photos with the sun coming in the different direction. Um, because it's hard to take photos into the sun, obviously. So, so it was a mix. Um, fortunately, the one, the good, the only good thing about these Zoom things is that I can uh, 
I can do the walk in the week leading up on the most favorable weather conditions. I don't have to do them at eight o'clock on Monday morning when it might be raining or it might be too hot. So it's the only, uh, it's really the only redeeming quality. Otherwise I'd much rather have you all with me in person. And next week, we're going to uh, go into the back part of Andy's way. Oh, that'll be fun. Great. Yeah. yeah, a whole different ecosystem. We're moving from the south end of the island now into, uh, well, the middle. OK, anybody else? Um. Thank you. It was great fun. Good. Glad to see you. <laughs> I'll see it in the fall. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Okay. <laughs> Looking forward to next week in Andy's way. That sounds great. Good. Good. Hey, thank you, Kim. Josie, You're wonderful. Thanks, Josie. <laughs> it's great, finished. Kim. <laughs> What's that? you get to finish your coffee now yeah well i only drink half of it hot and then it becomes iced coffee <laughs> perfect oh. yeah so. okay well stay cool and it's okay again maybe next monday yeah good <laughs>